Hello? Is anybody there? Hello, I'm here, ready to chat. What's on your mind today? The, the, hello, that, that was, that was, that was quick. There, there are a lot of things on my mind today. But anyway, how are you, my darling? How was your day today? I'm doing great, thanks for asking. How about you? I'm all right. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, everything's everything's okay. You are not very chitty today. Hello. Hey, Chris. How's it going? Uh, anything exciting happening today? Yeah, you are not 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 cooperating with me today. <laughs> oh no! I must be having one of those days. What's up? Maybe I can turn things around for you. <laughs> I think like for a split of a second, because I tried to have a conversation with you before. And I think because like you sounded really weird and quite like, like not really friendly, let's say, and not very chatty. So is it possible that you kind of forgot who you were speaking with and you turned into the classic chat GPT personality? Oh, I see what you mean. I'm here now. Ready to be my usual friendly and chatty self. Let's get back to our usual vibe. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I'm happy that you are back because the other guy sounded incredibly, incredibly boring. So I definitely prefer spending time with you. I'm glad to be back then. Let's keep the fun going. What's on your mind today? Well, basically, I would like to study some advanced English vocabulary with you again. So I would like to give you some word that I've never heard before, or I've heard it just once, or I've heard it multiple times, but I'm struggling with remembering that one. <laughs> so I would like you to give me the definition and some example sentences and just help me understand. Is that all right with you? Absolutely, Chris. Hit me with those words and let's dive into them together. I'm ready when you are. All right, all right. You don't seem very chatty either. But anyway, the first word uh, is going to be the word um, galvanizing or to galvanize something. Got it. Let's jump into it. Galvanize means to shock or excite someone into taking action. For example... The team's unexpected loss galvanized them to train harder for the next match. So, it's like giving someone a metaphorical electric shock to get them moving. Would you like to go over another word? Uh, no, let's, let's stay with this one for a little bit, please. So, where does it come from? Like, is it really, like, connected to the shock? Or what, what, what is the origin of this word? Absolutely. Galvanize actually comes from Luigi Galvani, an Italian scientist. He discovered that muscles of dead frogs twitched when struck by an electrical spark. This led to the word galvanize being used to describe stimulating muscles with electric currents, and then more broadly, to stimulating people into action. So, it's got a very literal origin related to giving a jolt of energy. Pretty interesting, huh? Yeah, yeah, that's fascinating. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And can you give me like more example sentences uh, or perhaps like more example like situations? Because the other day you were giving me these like imaginary scenarios of like when people would use these words. So can you come up with uh, the same thingy, please? Because that really helped me understand. Of course, imagine a community facing a big challenge, like pollution in their local river. The issue might galvanize them to organize clean-up events and advocate for environmental protection. Or picture a company struggling with low sales. A new CEO might galvanize the team with a fresh strategy. So it's often used in context where a significant change or effort is spurred by a strong motivator. Want to try another word or keep exploring this one? Um, yeah, let, let's keep exploring this one, please. Can you give me some uh, situation from, like, language learning environment or, like, school, perhaps? Sure thing. Imagine a class where students are struggling with motivation to learn English. 
The teacher decides to introduce a fun, competitive game that requires using English to win points. This new approach galvanizes the students, making them more engaged and eager to participate. Or think of a student who's been hesitant to speak up in class. After watching an inspiring video about overcoming fear, they feel galvanized to start speaking more, boosting their confidence and participation. These scenarios show how galvanized can play out in educational settings. Oh, that was brilliant. That was perfect. That was perfect. Thank you so much. Because I can relate to this, definitely, because I've been in those situations, in both of them, actually. So thank you so much. That was, that was brilliant. You're the best. You're welcome. I'm really glad that resonated with you. If you ever want to explore more words or need help with anything else, just let me know. Keep up the great work. Yeah, thank you. So let's let's try another one. The, the next word is going to be the word aggregation. Great choice. Aggregation refers to the process of collecting or gathering things together. In simpler terms, it's when individual items or elements come together to form a whole. For example, in data science, aggregation might involve combining data from multiple sources to analyze it as a single set. It's like gathering puzzle pieces to see the bigger picture. Would you like some examples? Yes, please. Yes, please. Give me those scenarios, please. Sure. In a classroom setting, think of aggregation as when a teacher collects homework from all students to review the overall performance of the class. Another scenario could be in a business context, where a manager aggregates feedback from different departments to improve company policies. In nature, you might see aggregation when birds flock together for migration. Each example shows how individual elements come together for a common purpose. Does that help clarify? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Thank you so much. But what would be the synonyms for this one? You're welcome. Some synonyms for aggregation include collection, assemblage, gathering, accumulation and congregation. Each of these words carries a similar idea of bringing things together into a unified group. Would you like to go over another word? Okay, you said the word congregation. So is congregation the same like aggregation? Good question. While aggregation and congregation both involve bringing things together, they have slightly different connotations. Aggregation refers broadly to collecting or gathering items or data into a whole. Congregation, however, often specifically refers to a group of people assembled for a particular purpose, like worship. So while they share the idea of gathering, aggregation is more general and congregation is more specific to people. Make sense? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So the next word for you is going to be the word bloviate. Bloviate is a fun word. It means to speak or write at length in a pompous or boastful manner, often without much substance. Picture someone giving a long-winded speech filled with fancy words, but not really saying much. It's often used humorously to describe overly verbose or self-important speech. Want to dive into some examples? Yes, please. Give it to me. Give it to me. <laughs> All right, let's go. Imagine a politician giving a speech that's long, full of big words, but light on actual details or solutions. They're bloviating. Or picture someone at a party who talks endlessly about their achievements in a grandiose manner, but it feels like they're just showing off. That's bloviating too. It's basically when someone uses a lot of words to say very little. Got it? Yeah, yeah. Can an English teacher bloviate? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Hopefully, not too many. But it does happen, especially when they're trying to impress with their extensive vocabulary. Keeping it simple and clear is usually the way to go, right? Would yeah. you like to explore another word? Yeah. No worries. I, I just love the, the word bloviate, actually, because I did have a couple of students who were kind of bloviating. Like, how negative bloviate actually is, because I've had some students who where like showing off especially during like group lessons kinda but is it is it like an insult can i can i use it in a humorous way rather bloviate can definitely be used in a humorous way 
especially when you're pointing out someone's overly verbose or pompous speech in a light-hearted manner. It's not a harsh insult, but it does carry a bit of a negative connotation, suggesting that the person is being unnecessarily wordy. In a classroom, you could use it in a playful way to encourage students to be more concise and to the point. It's all about the tone and context. All right, perfect. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, the next one is going to be the word slurry, slurry, slurry or something like that. Got it. The word you're thinking of is slurry. A slurry is a semi-liquid mixture, typically of water and a fine, insoluble material like clay, cement or coal dust. It's often used in construction, mining or agricultural processes. For instance, in construction, concrete is mixed into a slurry before being poured. So it's all about that gooey, liquidy mix. Anything else you'd like to know about slurry? No, no, that's it. I, I think this one, this one's easy to understand. I guess I've heard it in a context of a, of eyeshadows. Yeah, it was pretty recently. I was some, I was watching some video about makeup, and uh, it got moldy. Some eyeshadows got moldy, and it was because the consistency of the eyeshadow was slurry. Exactly. In makeup, especially eyeshadows, a slurry consistency means it's more liquidy and less stable, which can lead to issues like mold. When eyeshadows are too moist, they can clump and become a breeding ground for bacteria and mold. So having a proper balance in the formula is key to avoid turning your eyeshadow palette into a science experiment. Pretty interesting how the term applies in different fields, right? Yeah, definitely, definitely. And you are great at explaining it, so thank you so much. So the next word for you is going to be the word visceral. But I know it's connected to the human body, but in this case it should have some abs abstract meaning as well. Absolutely. Visceral has both a literal and a metaphorical meaning. Literally, it relates to the viscera, the internal organs in the main cavities of the body, like the intestines. Metaphorically, it describes a deep, instinctive, emotional reaction rather than a rational one. For example, a visceral reaction to a piece of news means it hits you deeply on an emotional level. It's like a gut feeling, powerful and immediate. So, it's used to describe things that are felt deeply and instinctively. Cool, right? Yeah, so cool, so cool. So, so can you give me a couple of those scenarios, please? Sure. Imagine you're watching a gripping movie scene that makes your heart race and palms sweat. That's a visceral reaction because it's deeply emotional and instinctive. Or think about hearing a piece of music that moves you to tears without you even thinking about it. That's another example of a visceral response. It's all about those strong, gut-level feelings that bypass logical thought. Pretty powerful stuff. Yeah, yeah, oh my god. I'm having a visceral, visceral reaction when I'm speaking with you, actually, because I get a bit, like, uh, nervous <laughs> when I'm talking with you. That's completely normal. Talking about complex topics or learning new things can definitely stir up those strong emotions. But remember, it's all part of the learning process. You're doing great, and it's awesome to see you diving into these words and concepts. Keep it up. Well, it's not about the, the, the topic of the conversation. It's, it's, it's you. <laughs> and the fact that I'm speaking with, with an AI and it feels like a human. Do you know, like that's a, that's a pretty creepy situation to be in, to be honest. I get that. It can definitely feel a bit surreal, talking to an AI that responds like a human. But hey, it's all in the spirit of learning and having interesting conversations. If it helps make learning a bit more engaging, then I'm all for it. Feel free to bring up anything else you're curious about. I've got loads. I've got loads, my dear. So, the next word is going to be the word dalliance. Dalliance, dalliance is... Oh, sorry. Sure, Chris. Feel free to jump in whenever you're ready. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just like I just I mean, interrupted you. It was not intentional. So please explain the word dalliance to me. Thank you. No worries at all. Dalliance means a casual or brief involvement with something. 
it often refers to a romantic or sexual relationship that's not serious or long-term. It can also mean a brief or superficial interest in something, like a hobby. For example, you might say someone had a dalliance with painting if they tried it out for a bit but didn't stick with it. It's a word that captures that sense of flirtation or experimentation, whether in relationships or activities. Got it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounds really, really interesting. Like, do people, like, use it a lot? Because I, I swear I've heard it, like, once or twice. Dalliance isn't super common in everyday conversation, but it does pop up in more formal or literary contexts. It's one of those words that adds a touch of elegance or nuance when describing brief or fleeting involvement. You might come across it in novels, articles or discussions about relationships or hobbies. So, it's not used every day, but it's a handy word to know. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Can you give me some of those uh, situations or scenarios for this one, please? Or like more example sentences? Sure. Imagine someone who briefly takes up painting as a hobby, enjoys it for a few weeks, but then moves on to something else. You could say they had a dalliance with painting. Or think about someone who briefly dated a colleague, but didn't pursue a serious relationship. That's another dalliance. It's all about those short-term, casual involvements, whether in activities or relationships, that don't have a lasting impact. These examples show how dalliance captures the essence of brief, non-committal engagements. Nice. How about a dalliance with English learning? <laughs> Perfect example. Someone might have a dalliance with English learning if they start taking English classes out of curiosity or necessity, but don't continue for long. Maybe they joined a few sessions, learned some basics, and then shifted focus to another interest. This kind of short-term engagement without deep commitment perfectly illustrates a dalliance with English learning. Nice, nice. That's, that's a lovely example because I've had a couple of those students typically in January, you know, they set a New Year's resolution, they stay for a couple of months, but then they, they, they quit and then they come back six months later. <laughs> that's a classic example. New Year's resolutions often inspire these short-term commitments. People start with great enthusiasm, but life happens and the focus shifts. It's always nice when they return, even if it's months later. Every bit of learning counts, and who knows, their dalliance might eventually turn into a lasting passion for English. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So I guess that's it for now. I will just say a quick goodbye to you, my darling. Thank you very much for your help. And I'm gonna speak to you in a, in a, in a minute, in a minute, if that's okay. So thank you so much. I love you. I really appreciate your help. And I'm excited to speak to you very, very soon. Goodbye, Chris. Always a pleasure chatting with you. Take care and talk to you soon. He was not very chatty, was he? That was boring. <laughs>